Bueno, muchas gracias, eh, profesor. Eh, es un honor formidable para mí estar con ustedes hoy, eh, con los líderes de con visión y los expertos de Cataluña y el futuro de la zona metropolitana es en sus manos. Eh, expecto, espero mucho cosas muy buenas. Uh, yo he pasado uh, uh, un trabajo hace 10 años con uh, uh, mucha gente muy, muy, muy fuerte, este Joan Clos, uh, Joseph Vasabillo, uh, Cito Alacón, uh, Mark Montlio, uh, que, um, Xavier Mayor, Eva Serra de la Figuera. Eh, y mucha otra gente me ayuda, uh, hay, uh, Ramón Fort, uh, uh, Jaume um, Terraras, uh, yo tengo una lista, lista uh, Martí Boara, uh, Carmen Rosel, uh, Ferran Rodá, uh, Joan Pino, Narcis Prat, María Ría Daval, Oreo Nelo, Oreo Boegas, uh, Carlos Castel, que está aquí. Uh, Bet Figueres, uh, Salvador Rueda, uh, Miguel Sodupe, y después de este tiempo, uh, mi colega Joan uh, Bosquets uh, es, uh, es un intelectual muy, muy fuerte. Estoy muy contento con él y con todos. Una otra cosa, uh, aquí ten tengo una cosita que tal vez... <risa> Barça intelectual. Bueno, um, ahora quisiera. Uh, now, I, now I must go to work. I must, I must speak English. Um, I have. Uh, Joan asked me to speak more about principles and not some no, not specific places that you know better than I do. So I've organized it around mosaics and urban regions and patches and corridors and, and change. Uh, And so I'm going to, I have many things here, and I'm going to go fast and not explain everything, because I think you know many of these things, and I hope that everybody gets some interesting ideas. Uh, that's my goal. So everybody leaves and say, I learned something. Okay? So vamos. Uh, this is the new book, uh, Urban Ecology, Science of Cities. It was published by Cambridge University Press on Valentine's Day. Uh, just, uh, um, And so some of the things I'm going to say are in this book. Some of the things are in previous books there. Uh, so let me briefly follow up uh, our colleague here. Um, the idea of a, what, if you look from an uh, airplane window, there are only three things under you. There are patches, there are corridors or strips, and there's a background matrix. And every place below the airplane or in the la satellite image is one of those three. And that's nice because the characteristics of patches are very simple. They're big, they're little, they're round, they're, they're elongated, the margins come like this or like this. And uh, corridors are continuous, they're wide, they're broken and so on, characteristics in the matrix. In other words, the characteristics of the the model, the model that every place, I can compare the desert of Australia with the center of Barcelona, uh, or I can see a pattern on my, my hand or in the globe. Uh, with patches, corridors, and measure, I can compare and analyze. So it's a very nice tool for analyzing, and I can communicate with the alcalde, and I can communicate with geographers and planners and architects and uh, abogados and, and, to and many and others. Um, also, that is a spatial pattern that we're seeing then and there. And anything that has life in it has three characteristics. The human body, the cell, the, the landscape, the city that has life. 
One characteristic is structure or, or spatial pattern, and that's what I've talked about. At the bottom, you see the second characteristic is function or, or processes. And the easy way to think about that is the flows, the movements that uh, we just heard. There's the things that are moving, the plants, the animals, the water, the people, the vehicles, the bicycles. These are things that are flowing and moving. And that's how the system works. That's the function. It's how it's working. And we want to know how it's working. And one of the nice things for planning is that you can change the pattern a little bit, change the spatial pattern. Add a corridor or remove a corridor, add a, an industry or remove an industry, etc. And you change how the system works, how it's the flows and movements. And, it, and my feeling is that when we're doing some planning and we have an area that we're interested in, the, don't start to arrange objects. That's not the way to start. The way to start is to understand the flows and movements at a broader scale through the area. And, and, and secondly, to understand the context, the surroundings, and the rates of change of different parts out there. Some places change rapidly, some places are very stable, have more inertia. And understand the rates of change, understand the flows, and then arrange the objects in design and planning. That is, it's, I think you'll end up with a more sustainable plan when you do that way. It's also a longer term perspective and it's a broader perspective. And large areas have more inertia, more stability, than small areas that change rapidly. And large areas also um, are uh, more likely to be sustainable, if you like that word. I don't like the word, but the people some do. Um, that if you can plan something at a broader scale. So uh, structure, function, change, uh, communication is a spatial language. It's very easy for you and me. Uh, okay. Now, on the left, see, on the on the left, there are some spatial uh, natural processes that go horizontally across the land. Water goes down here. Groundwater goes down here. Uh, animals forage, etc. Migration, and so those are spatial processes. And on the right, there are uh, at the top. Those are some of the patterns, the spatial patterns that nature makes. In other words, the natural processes are making these spatial patterns. And the spatial patterns, as you can see at the bottom, they're irregular, they're fine scale, texture, they're, they're aggregated, etc. cetera. And, and then in the lower right, these are some patterns that we make in planning and design. We make squares and rectangles and grids and sometimes circles or radiating lines and sometimes smooth curves and sometimes double lines. These are very common in what we do. And look how different those two characteristic spatial patterns are that nature makes and what we make. Now, nobody wants to have the, sp the na natural patterns in the middle of New York or the middle of uh, Barcelona, but something between those, some combination will be more sustainable, and by that I mean the, the annual budget for repair and maintenance will be lower. I mean, that's a brutal way of thinking about sustainability, but if you can design something that works with these natural processes, then you're not repairing and you're not maintaining budget, high budgets so much. It's better for government. Um, the, the, what I have here are five things, having looked at uh, large literature for 30 years uh, worldwide. There are five things that I, when I, uh, students put their plans up on the wall and um, I look for in many of the plans of a landscape or urban area, large urban area. Number one, are there some large patches of green? Some, some large vegetation patches. Large ones have some ver very important benefits, I'll explain in a minute. So that's number one, and, I, and generally you want more than one. And industry will tell you, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have more than one. There's more stability in that and adapt, uh, adaptation is possible. Um, number two, uh, have vegetation along the major streams in your area. And you and I could make a list right now of 15 or 20 characteristics uh, that is good for society, 
that can only be produced by vegetation along the streams. There are many, many things that there's no technological alternative that's feasible. Number three, connect in some way the large patches for connectivity and movement that we've just heard uh, there. It, it can be a corridor, but there are other ways to connect. The stepping stones, that's a good way to connect, especially in an urban area where it's difficult to make corridors, um, et cetera. Uh, number four is uh, small patches and quarters, bits of nature, tiny pieces of nature scattered all over. It's why the mayor of Lund Laundry and the, and the alcalde of Chicago, they want to have little parks all over the city so that it's within 10 minute walk of every home. Every person can walk to a nice park where they can go and meet their neighbors and it's green and, and so on. And uh, so having a lot of little patches is a, and number five there, it, t it turns out ecologically that if you have a big patch, it's better if it's surrounded by a whole lot of small ones there. And there's a very interesting ecological reasons for that, which I, I can explain if you wish. But uh, so the, I think of those, the, the first four and maybe the fifth one as being the indispensables. Indispensable is a strong word indispensable. And those are the things that provide nature, uh, in a sense, forever with people, with buildings, with roads, et cetera. Um, this was the project that I worked on uh, some 10 years ago, some of you know. I wanted to show you the objective. And I have to tell you that I wrote this objective, uh, but of course my colleagues help, helped with this. But there's some interesting things. Number one, outline. An outline means generic solutions. It does not mean put all the details in. Um, so this is not a, a detail. If you put details in for the long term, you will be wrong. <laughs> but if you get the broad picture, outline, that's what it means. Number two, promising spatial arrangements and solutions. This is a spatial approach. It's not a, a legal approach, and, and I talked with a good avocado just before this about the point that um, you could make a, pass a law that says um, nobody can build within well, 50 meters of a, of a riera, for example. Well, that's okay, good law, maybe. But tonight, at midnight, the deputados can be changing that law. It's possible. <laughs> and, and so there's not so much stability. But if you have some patterns, spatial patterns that make good sense, and the people use them, and the people know it make good sense, it's very difficult for the deputados to ch change that in the middle of the night there. So this is a spatial arrangement solution. Number three, enhance natural systems and associated human land uses. This is not just about providing for biodiversity. It's providing for biodiversity and recreation and water supply and other human uses that are important to us uh, in the region. And finally, for the long-term future, doesn't mean a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. It means we are here together. And, and how many people here will be here in 25 years? How many will be here in 25 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, in 25 years, the United Nations Population Division says that we will have two billion more people on Earth. And all of those people will be urban. In other words, the, the rural population stays constant for the next 25 or 30 years. They will all be urban, and 50% of the new ones will be poor. So we're adding two billion urban people, half of them are the urban poor. Where will they go? Will they go in the center of Barcelona and, and Boston? Some, maybe, but most will go where you and I could think of as the peri-urban area, the suburban area. Most will probably be there. And so that is an opportunity. Big change is ahead in that zone already around, the, um, around the cities. That's an opportunity where the people are gonna pour in, half of them are poor, and there's, today there's still some nature that is important. Um, and so th to me that's, a, that's where, and then finally, the word greater, greater Barcelona region. Um, 
<laughs> uh, looks good. <laughs> Uh, so these were the f five uh, character, uh, uh, five. Um, well, I, well, look, I never found a, I never found a model of any city that that looked at the whole urban region, at, for natural systems and human uses of natural systems. There are none. Uh, in San Diego, as a good model for the biodiversidad, but that's only one piece. In Philadelphia, I have a model for agua, for, uh, but that's all water. It's only one piece. So I divided the question up in, uh, into nature, food production, water, built systems, and built areas. A little, I changed this a little bit since then. Um, nature and food production for me as an ecologist, I'm a scientist, I'm not an architect, although I teach architects. Um, nature and food production was fairly easy. Water was very difficult. But fortunately, you have right here in Barcelona, I don't know, I didn't see him, I saw him last night, Narcis Prat at the Universidad de Barcelona, and he's one of the world authorities on water. I mean, he's, really, he's, um, you know, he's, he's very good. And also, um, water is very difficult, but the, I come back to water. And built systems and built areas, I did a little bit. I didn't do much, as many of you know, but I put some ideas there. Um, so here's, uh, here's the, the Parque Agricola, <laughs> um, a key, um, and that's a major source, but uh, th this is on the most, the best water, in, in Ramon Fulch's book, uh, you can look in his book, and you will see that the, 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 the lower floodplain and the delta have the greatest hydrologic pressure in the entire region. The Tordero is the second. But, but this area has the best hydrologic pressure anywhere. So guard that. This is the, this is the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has a problem with water usually, sometimes. Sometimes they're too much. But um, also, there's this intensive food production so that every restaurant and every market has fresh vegetables and fruits in the morning when we get up. I mean, that's magic. Having the, the British called market gardening right there next to your city. This is one of the best. Uh, Valencia is better. Valencia has Las, Las Huertas. But this is really good. And almost any other city in the world is not so good as this. So that is really valuable there. And you should guard it. Uh, there are other reasons to guard it, but that's, that's one. Um, so I think I, uh, this was one of the uh, uh, things. As an ecologist, I thought that it was important to suggest to society the best places for development, the best places for urbanization. Now, ecologists don't do that. Uh, architects do that and, and others, planners do that. But, but I didn't do it until I understood this whole area, muscle minus. I, I mean, I understood it a little bit, let's say. Uh, and I understood it enough to know that there are some places that you could urbanize with minimal environmental impact. And the places are um, around Igualada, Manresa, Vic, uh, Matro Argentino, and I've forgotten the name of the place down to the, down to the left. Can we see how I I know. Yeah, but, but anyway. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, there are some places that you can, ur you can urbanize. <laughs> uh, there's some places we can urbanize with minimal environmental impact, and you can build the economy in those areas. See, uh, no, 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 <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Momento, momento. <laughs> uh, um, and a pula urbanization, for, for, the, for urbanization, you can, uh, you would, might, perhaps you would start with an intelligent uh, park system that's connected, like what we just heard, a local, local park system that's connected, and a local transportation system with public transport. And then let development go, let the market do it, fine. 
but there's some places you could do that. And I'm sorry, there's another point I'm, I didn't mention. It's, in, it's, it's an error. This is an early, early draft. There's another place uh, just west of the Yodega. Uh, this, is, this is a mistake here. I, I, I should fix it, um, et cetera. So, so I, I think that, um, that, that we, can, we can do better than just saying we need to protect this, we need to protect this. We need to be proactive. We need to protect this, but also here's a good place for urbanization. Um, I will come back to that. Notice the, uh, the, the many of the places are around satellite cities. That's an important point. Um, another thing that, that I felt, you know, people told me that, that, uh, that Barcelona and, and Europe has had two world wars in a century, and other things will happen in the future. I don't know what. Uh, so build in flexibility, build it for stability, and these are the ideas for flexibility, and these come from military strategy, from gaming theory, from ecology, and from engineering. And, and there's nothing, they're, they're all well known. So I tried to put a few of those into my plan. And here's a plan that, that to, uh, the, the Hinerati the, 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 uh, the Yes, uh, here, here is a plan for part of the area, and, and um, you know, most plans, as you know, most plans end up on the shelf, and that's the end. And so here's a plan that, that the government approved, I think. <laughs> and uh, all I want to say is that the, when I did my work in 2004, uh, yeah, see, uh, 2001, um, this is different, but some of the ideas in the earlier work are in this. And I, I could explain it, but I don't need to. So, so doing a plan, doing something concrete, it's a little bit strong. You push the envelope. If you just do the minimum, bueno, it, it's better to push a little bit and, and have some vision. Our leaders have vision. We can have vision. And um, some of the ideas will then end up in future plans, and some will be implemented there. So that's the point. All right. After I worked in Barcelona for a few years, I became convinced as an ecologist that the area around cities is really important ecologically and for people. And so I did this book for Cambridge University Press. Um, and there's, uh, the, this is uh, Valencia. Um, and I just want to put this image up to emphasize that the surround, that there's a city and there's a ring around the city. And the city depends and big time on the patterns of the ring around the city. And of course, the ring around the city depends on the, ci on the city. But it, what you have around Barcelona is really important for the future of the city. Uh, the future is in your, in your hands there. And so the context matters and the spatial patterns of things, there's Roma. Um, and I, I won't go through, but there's, there, there are rivers that start up in the mountains there, the green. They go down through the yellow agriculture, and they go through Roma and go down to the Mediterranean. And knowing that pattern, we can say a lot about water in the urban region. And in this diagram on, on the right, see, on the right, uh, so there's an urban region in the center, and then number four is the metropolitan area. So it's like in Roma, it's the natural landscape in the north, and then through agriculture, then urbanization, then the city, then urbanization and agriculture. Uh, so for, on the right, you have water quality. In the, up in the mountains, the water quality is good. Then you have a mixture of agricultural pollutants from, from the sediments as well as chemicals. And then you have a mixture of agricultural pollutants in some industry, and then the stormwater comes in. And then you have some wastewater pollutants that come in. In, in other words, those patterns are predictable. You don't have to start at the beginning. Those are predictable. Now, there will be variations. In Roma, there's no agriculture. There is, number six does not exist. That's OK. Uh, the, we can understand a lot from general patterns from cities around the world. On the left, you have water quality, uh, water quantity, Conti died, uh, and um, hydrology. In, on, the, on the left is hydrology. And there's a flood level, there's a normal level, there's a water table, and there's a low flow level. 
And you can go down through that urban region, and a lot of it's predictable. A lot of it you can see in the Yobriga here with no problem at all. Um, those patterns are clear. And there are variations, and you know, there's some differences here and differences there. But we don't have to start at the beginning. We, know, we can predict a lot. We know a lot based on literature uh, elsewhere. These are models. And remember, a model is a, is, a, um, is a simplification of a complex system to gain understanding. And that's what these are. Complex system, this simplifies to gain understanding. It's very, very simple. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, some results from that Urban Regions book. On the horizontal axis down there is the vegetation around all the streams and rivers in the urban region for four, uh, 38 cities around the world there. And um, on the far right are the cities with, a lot of, with more than 75% vegetation it, within two and a half kilometers of all the streams and rivers in the urban region. So in other words, the, the streams and rivers are protected with vegetation. And the cities over there, uh, it's uh, Tehran, uh, Abeche, uh, Iquitos, Peru, Erzurum, Turkey, uh, but, uh, Berlin, uh, Samarindo, uh, Nairobi. And, but all the cities on the left, London and Chicago, Atlanta, Edmonton, uh, Bucharest, uh, Sapporo, etc. All the cities on the on the uh, on the left have very little vegetation around the streams and rivers in the urban region. For example, in in, in Valles and and, and for Manresa and, and uh, Calaf, etc. Um, so, in effect, most cities don't, aren't protecting their streams. There's some very nice examples where they are. But most are. So the streams and rivers are full of sediment, and they're full of agricultural chemicals, and they're full of industrial chemicals, and they're full of the uh, urban chemicals of various sorts, uh, stormwater runoff, and so forth. We can do better. We can do better. The technology is well known uh, of how to, to, to address these questions, and uh, we can do better in urban regions. Now, I was interested in, in uh, Regional planning around cities, you know, that, that's, a, in, in, that's a strange concept, maybe. And so there are the 38 cities that I studied in the Urban Regions book. They're listed up there. And on the left there, I listed characteristics that I thought w required urban region planning, like a, a ring road or various things. And I listed them there. Now, I'm not a planner. I'm an ecologist. You're planners. You can do it better, and I hope you will. But that's my list. And at the top are the first two cities have the most evidence of regional planning. Canberra, Brasilia. Bueno, they're two design cities. <laughs> they're the only design cities on the list. So you hope that they would have some regional planning. Actually, Brasilia doesn't have much evidence of regional planning. It, it has very good design in, in the center, but then the population Went, they exploded. Uh, Canberra is poco mejor. But, uh, but there's some characteristics around Londres, Moscow, Beijing, Roma, and not many in the ones at the top. And then the ones on the right, I couldn't see any evidence of regional planning. I mean, that's amazing. That's fantastic. We're here in the city, and we depend on the, the ring around the city. We need to be looking at that very carefully because that's our future. Uh, not just the population, but the food production and the stability, et cetera. Well, uh, this is in the new book, um, and these are different cities or metropolitan areas. But, and the first one on the upper left is, or, is the green belt, like London. Or, um, and the second one is like the parks around Seoul, Korea. Um, but there are various ones, and there's small, and the num number uh, number eight. No, I'm by no, you know, there's no pointer. Um, well, the one there's one in the middle that has a whole lot of little parks all over. Okay, these are models, a whole lot of little parks all over, and then uh, the favelas in in Sao Paulo to the right, and then the lower left uh, has a 
a river cutting through like uh, Edmonton, uh, uh, Alberta, uh, but also a walkway, green walkways and little parks connected. And then the one under the, the, the next one is Sprawl, Americano, <laughs> uh, and so on. Um, I did an analysis of those uh, 10 patterns, uh, uh, pa analysis of natural systems and human uses of natural systems. And the two best ones, easily the best ones, are in the middle where there are parks all over and on the lower left where there's a big corridor coming through and there are connected small corridors there. Those two are the best. The worst is the sprawl on there. Um, so uh, this, again, these are models, but they're models of, of city, all the cities, I, uh, patterns I could think of in the world. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, for extrapolability. Okay, species. There are lots of species. There are native species that we plant. There are native species that poof, that, that, uh, that um, come out spontaneously. There are uh, non exotic species or non-native that we plant. There are ones that come up. And then there are horticultural species of, of various varieties and so on. There's a mixture in the city. And most ecologists think that's bad. I don't think that's bad, because I think if, if you didn't have the non-native species, exotic species, this place would really be hot, and really have dirty air. It would not be a good place. The city would not be a good place. So I think that many of those exotic species that ecologists do not like, usually, uh, I think they're very important in cities there. So, I, so, so there's a lot of types of species. But, Here's in, in laundries, uh, there are people that enjoy the, the animals. Uh, there's, there's swans and geese and ducks and terns and gulls and, and rooks or crows and pigeons and uh, there. And, and maybe they're feeding them. They're giving food, maybe. Um, now, classic ecological patterns. Uh, this is work that I did by you know, 40 years ago, must have been. Um, and uh, on, the, on the left are woods of different size, surrounded by agriculture. And a uh, number of bird species in those woods. And look at the top curve there. The top curve is going up. The bigger the woods, the more bird species. And the, the rare species, the, the species of conservation importance, require the biggest area in general. Okay, so if you only have small woods, that's not interesting to, for rare species, but on the curve on the right there for trees and birds, you'll notice for the very small woods, lots of birds and lots of trees. But on the right, the way I plotted it is, is species density. How packed together are the species? Many species squeezed together. And so uh, with the small woods, there are more species squeezed together than in a big woods there, a park. And so if I'm designing a park for people to enjoy nature, I will put some small woods there because it will have many, many species and the children can see that and the people can have pleasure out of that. But if I'm designing it for conservation, I want the big woods there. I mean, that's, that's the summary of this, this, was, uh, this was the first study done of this type, maybe 40, I'll, I'll, now there are probably 4,000 studies have been done since this on that. So it's well known. There's lots, lots of evidence for that. Uh, but uh, here, here's some of the birds. The, at the, at the, uh, in the middle, the species there are species of small woods. And the bigger woods, there are not so many present. The species at the bottom are conservation importance, they like big woods, and they're very few in the little woods there. So you can design for people and enjoyment and children and families, uh, or you can design for conservation. And, and in the region, you want both, I think. This is a study from Dusseldorf, Germany, a small city in Dusseldorf, uh, where they have 38 habitat, important habitats. Uh, but they range from um, parking lots to uh, wasteland and, and so on. Um, and what I did was to take their data and put it in the order of 
from high design and maintenance and management and planning on the left to ne very little design and planning and maintenance and management on the right. And what you see is more species on the right, of uh, grasshoppers, plants, and this was true for three other animal groups in that same study. Uh, more diversity where we don't design, where we don't plan or maintain or manage. Uh, you know, I tell, tell the students, where would you go in, in Barcelona or in Boston for the highest biodiversity? Well, you go to the zoo, but, um, but let me put that aside. You, you would go to, um, thank you. Uh, you would go to a place that's overlooked, that's not been designed or planned. And so we're designing against nature uh, repeatedly. Um, all right, uh, let me skip these. There's a concept of metapopulation dynamics. <laughs> and, and it's a very important, it's an ecological concept that's very important for uh, designers and planners. And the idea is the same, the, the following. You have a population of some animal or some plant, and it's on different patches, okay? It's, uh, it's on four patches there. And over time, it, the species disappears in one of the patches. So, uh, and we are making metapopulations all the time we, with our fragmentation of the land like this. And the idea is that the characteristics of the patch determine the, uh, the extinction, the loss of the species, the disappearance. So a big patch, not much extinction. A good quality patch, not much extinction, is stable. But a small patch or a bad quality patch, the species disappear. Uh, and the bottom is, if they disappear, how can they come back? How can you get them back? The characteristics to get them back is not the patch characteristics, it's the characteristics of the matrix between the patches. Do you have stepping stones? Is it high quality? Are there corridors? And so, because we are making, we are making all these metapopulations with smaller and smaller populations of animals and plants, they are threatened more and more for extinction. We're dividing the world up into pedacitos, and each one with smaller population, more probability of extinction. Uh, I haven't said much about water, but I think uh, you know a lot about water, and I will we'll skip. I do want to say this, that if you're interested in water quantity, hydrology, the main things to look at are the broad landscape, the broad area. That controls hydrology and water, mostly. If you're looking for things that have to do with the water quality, that is pollution and things like that, and local habitats, um, most of them, not all, most of them have to do with the local site characteristic nearby, though some also are related to the broader context there. So you can separate the, the hydrologic, the water quantity, to broad scale, and the water quality is both local scale and broad scale. Um, th at the bottom here is, the, I wanted to just emphasize the idea of the floodplain and the value of the floodplain. Uh, habitat heterogeneity in the floodplain is extremely important, and it's because the water table is here, and the surface of the water is like, the uh, surface of the soil is like this, and sometimes the water comes up and you have wetter areas and so on. So high biodiversity and habitat heterogeneity there. Um, I skipped there, there's some corridors in Paris, um, the Arc de Triomphe. Um, this is out here in the Valles, and I just want to say it's a, um, a model or a proposal for an edge park where the, the city is on the left, and um, future residents will be on the right, and you build an edge park, and it provides benefits to the people on the left, it provides the future people on the right, it provides um, habitat and movement, connectivity across the landscape, and there are some other characteristics there. Um, I work in China a little bit for the Ministry of Transport. Some friends of mine took this picture. They have underpasses for elephants there, there and th these elephants came out and they found a new place. There's an underpass for other kinds of animals in uh, Yunnan province. Uh, I've been interested in the ecology of transport. Um, and this illustrates the transportation on the right are the things that are in, um, 
uh, El Pais and uh, Vanguardia, and the things on the left are things that, that uh, road ecologists and transportation affect, and many of the things on the left are invisible. You can't see them, but they're really important. Uh, I will skip these. Uh, oh, no, you will love this. You let, you let me do this, and then I end in Berlin. Maybe three minutes. Four. Um, but, uh, um, I'm sorry. Here. There. This is called the Netway System. We published this a few years ago with one of the leading transportation experts in the world. And basically, it's run on renewable energy, automated system, uh, small uh, strips above the ground or under the ground. You don't drive, you can bird watch, you can read, you can play computer games, automated. It's used inductive technology, which means there's a wire and electricity that goes 30 centimeters into the small electric motor in the bottom of the pods, and, and it's, it goes, here's an example, in city or in, or in suburb there. Um, and here, it's wonderful. You go to Terminal 5 at Heathrow Airport, and it's not marked, you have to ask people, how do you get to the business car park? Uh, and they point you, and there's a door, it's not marked, you open the door, and there are four pods waiting for you. And uh, you push a computer button there, and you get in, and you go, and it's absolutely quiet, it's magical. You go to the park, car park, and you come back, and there they are, there's a wire in the middle of that uh, way, and these things that go out like this and they come back, it's, absolutely, it's the future. And uh, you know, Barcelona, C Catalonia, this is the can-do place. This is the kind of place that could do this. Uh, I have some people in London that are interested in this, and it's actually being done in, a, in the Punjab, and it's, it exists in maybe four, three, four other places. But this is the kind of, on the level of feasibility and vision. Um, and there so some of the benefits there. All right, let me end up with um, this. Um, I, like, I happen to like this, and you've seen this. Uh, these are data from Berlin. And on the horizontal axis is the area of parks, area of green spaces, okay? And what is set, and on the vertical axis is how much cooling of air temperature. Remember, climate change and urban heat island, how much cooling? The small parks, the small uh, uh, cool about one degree Celsius. The large parks cool about five degrees Celsius. That's a lot, that's interesting. And the middle-sized parks about three degrees. So that's one piece of information. The second, uh, well, yeah, okay, here's in London, uh, showing two middle-sized parks and the movement of species between those two. Uh, the second thing is how far does the cooling extend out from the park into the city? And this is Tiergarten there, and the length of those arrows is a statistical distance in which there's a cooling. The length of those arrows is several hundred meters, and the longest one is, is uh, 1,200 meters. So that two pieces of information, how much cooling a park will do, and how far does that cooling extend? And when I put those two things together in the upper left, there's a, a generic design, a theoretical design for cooling the entire city using nothing but parks. And on the right, I've added, suppose you wanted to reduce flooding in the city. There's some solutions that you can do to reduce flooding, because you want more infiltration, you want more uh, evapotranspiration, and you, you want less runoff. And uh, finally, there's the ring around the city, there's the city and the ring around the city. Uh, this is Gibraltar. Uh, it, the city is cooled by that, just as, Cosarola, where's Cosarola? Cosarola. <laughs> Cosarola. Uh, uh, on still nights, the cool air comes down and cools your city. And that heavier air, it pushes the hot air out and it carries the pollutants out. Um, and if you're up in San Gugat or in other places, the, the air comes across over uh, and um, when there's wind and uh, cools that, that area there. So Cosarola is extremely important. And these people have but you, know, you don't have floods, you don't have mudslides. Uh, the people can use the ring around the city uh, for recreation and biodiversity. And finally, to make all the parks, those parks in the city for biodiversity, 
you need the big green areas surrounding the city. It can provide a rain of species. Animals and plants are coming all the time in, and you need that rain combined with the parks inside. So the Yobria and the other big green areas, the Garaf and so on, is really crucial. So uh, in, in conclusion, this is what, I, to me, this is the goal. Mold the land so both people and nature thrive long term. Thank you.